Teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as He takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of Joel. Joel meaning Yahweh is God. And no ifs, ands, or buts, directly to the point. Joel, the subject of the entire book is the Lord's day, the Lord's coming. But the most important thing for you today is that it gives you the events that just precede his coming. Which means to the generation which lives in the parable of the fig tree, and whether you realize it or not, you do, these things become very important because it lets you know the events that will transpire. God speaks of this locust army that is described in Revelation chapter 9. It's not really locust. It just simply means that the opposition under Satan's control will be that well organized coming against us. But it doesn't matter how, for you God's elect, it doesn't matter how well Satan is organized. Why? We have power over him. We have the authority. And at the same time, um, if you use it, there's no problem, nothing to worry about. So God having announced the approach, as a matter of fact, I would say to put it in country terms, they're already so close, you can almost hear them. And God begins to give this, these instructions as to what you should do when you see that come to pass. Chapter 2. In other words, the advice, sound the alarm, warn people by planting seeds and so forth. We pick it up in verse 16 of that second chapter, and let's go with it from there with a word of wisdom from our Father. And it reads, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. In other words, it's, uh, it's time for a wedding, yes, but there's something unusual about this one. Is it was not normal that suckling babies and younger children were excused from this sort of uh, congregational meeting. But here, he says, bring them all. It's time for them to come out from under the bridal canopy, if you would. Verse 17, let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, not, not Satan now, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say to the Father, of course, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where's their God? Question. And the title Joel, then his name, Yah is God. So let there be no mistake. And um, with Yah being El in the Hebrew tongue, our Father expects those that have eyes to see and ears to hear to be Able, that's why he would say ministers of the Lord, not, not some one verse uh, revolving rev that is biblically illiterate, but one that can has eyes to see and ears to hear and is familiar with the signs of the times, knowing the season. No man knows the hour or the instant as it is written, but certainly a wise one does know the season and the events that transpire within it. Verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous of his land and pity his people. There's that lo ruhama, as we learn from the great book of Hosea, meaning salvation, that um, he shows uh, pity or mercy, if you would. You know, there's a strange thing about that 18th verse for you that are familiar with God's word, that in Revelation chapter 15, those that overcome the beast system and the beast himself and get over the mark are singing a song. 
And that song is the Song of Moses, Revelation 15 documents. The Song of Moses is recorded in 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. And, you know, everyone that has eyes to see and ears to hear is very familiar with that song. How do I, how can I say that? Because they're going to be singing it. They didn't, um, and uh, they at least understand what is said there concerning events of the last hour. Well, anyway, this 18th verse in uh, Joel 2 is the closing verse of the song of Moses written in Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. I think that's important, and you should make a home assignment to cover the 15th chapter, the first four verses of Revelation, and then begin with the last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 31, which gives the title of the song, being the Song of Moses, and go through to that 43rd verse. And at least, you don't have to memorize it necessarily, though many people have. You don't have to memorize it. Just know what is said. Verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, when they pray earnestly, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more, uh, now don't read over that, no more, make you a reproach among the heathen. That means never, 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 forever and ever. Verse 20, listen carefully. But I, that's emphatic, God speaking, I will remove far off from you the northern army, that's that locust army, only they're not locusts, they're men, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Like what? He pretended to be God. He brought that uh, army against our people. This should remind you of something, and in the book of Ezekiel, just before that great book of Daniel, in Ezekiel 39, you're not going to have it, but I'm, I'm going to... Um, cover it uh, for you here. What is it? Verse 39, 11. Okay, listen to this verse from Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's when the great no northern army led by the Antichrist out of Rush, beginning with Rosh. Uh, we read this. And it shall come to pass in that day, Ezekiel 39, 11, that I will, what day? The Lord's day, of course. That I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. The valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers, the stink, that is to say. And there shall they bury Gog. That means a, a multitude, all right? And all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog which is simply to say the multitude of God. I don't think it's any accident that Stuart's folly purchased the great uh, nation Alaska, country called Alaska, for $7 million, seven being spiritual completeness. And there is a valley, that, don't ask me to document this, just see it and know it when it comes to pass, because it shall. And, and, um, there will, it will be an uninhabited place. There will not any of our people. Notice it said the house of Israel, or the, the, the land that they possess, not the house of Judah. And remember, they're still separated at this time. Uh, see it and understand it when it does come to pass, because it will. Returning to Joel chapter 2, verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. In other words, God is going to do it himself so that the heathen that do not believe God is will find out very much that he's more than is. He is there. 
They will, they will not be some great human army that does this to the enemy. God himself will so that the heathen will know that he is God. Again, the title of the book, Joel, Yah is El, God is, uh, Yahweh is God. Verse 22, uh, verse 22 reads, Be not afraid. You ever get shook up? Don't be shook up. Be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. In what? In an abundance. This lets you know that the locust army, in, in part it does, is not actually locust because it would have destroyed the fields. Uh, in other words, we're not going to have a system that robs one of his uh, earthly hire or works. He will enjoy the fruit of his own labors. Verse 23, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the farmer rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the farmer rain, and the latter rain in the, in the first month. Now, I want you to note in your King James that the word month is in italics, meaning it's not in the manuscripts. It means, and the former rain and the latter rain wouldn't come down in the same month anyway. I'm, I'm going to give this to you in two ways. Because the former rain germinates the seed, and the latter rain matures the crop in the field that gives it water to bring forth its fruit. And what is talking about this is the rain of the latter days. Now, what this really should say is the latter rain will be as the first, plentiful and abundant. But at the same time, when will it fall? In the first month of the five-month period of Revelation chapter 9, when the locust army marches. There's going to have to be some ripening of fruit, that is to say, in the form of knowledge rapidly for some people. And God has chosen some to plant seeds so that that rain will have something to germinate, to broadcast them, whereby the truth is, is in the world. And when God gives the, the uh, development or the natural rain, that it may be germinated and produce more fruit, more fruit, and more fruit. Verse 24. And the doors shall be full of wheat, the floors, rather, shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. That, that means there is plenty. Re this refers back to chapter 1, where the locusts literally stripped everything. And the first time that many of the priests and others that were alcoholics or drunkards woke up saying, where's the wine? The wine's gone. Well, to get a new crop of wine, it takes a lot of work. First, you've got to restore the grapevines, press the grapes, and then it takes time to ferment. So there's going to be a lot of sobering up spiritually in that time before this verse 24 comes to pass, 25. And I will restore, I'm going to make good to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my, hey, listen, you wake up for me and don't miss this. My great army which I sent among you. Do you realize that your heavenly father controls that northern army? He calls it even his army. He sends it. He allows it. But don't ever forget the fact that he gave you power beforehand to be able to control it as far as your central location is concerned, meaning self. You don't have to worry about it. God not only controls the positive army, but the negative, to the point that those that have eyes to see and ears to hear are in charge. No problem. Can-do type people when you serve the living God. And people will yet fear. Is it not astonishing that people have such little faith that they don't realize that God has given them these awesome powers 
to protect themselves in this generation? 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. That's important because a lot of people will be. They'll be so ashamed they'll be crying for mountains to fall on them. Why? Because they have been taught that they're going to just, you know, fly out of here, put the gospel armor on and in place and get a jet propulsion pack and just push, whoosh out. All right? well, it isn't biblical. It isn't. It simply says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that you're going to meet Christ in a spiritual body at the seventh trump. But this happens in the sixth, the fifth and the sixth trump. You're going to be here. And those that with the uh, false army saying we're Jesus' army and he's here to rapture you away, they will be ashamed. They'll be praying for mountains to fall on them and cover them because they are good people. They're just ignorant when it comes to the chronological order of events that consummate the end of this age. 27. And ye shall know that I am, I am in the midst of Israel. Not above, not way off over there, in the midst of Israel, and that I am, I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Many higher critics think this is the typo here, a copyist error. It isn't. He lists it twice for emphasis. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughter shall prophesy. Whoop, whoop, oh, wait, wait, wait. Daughters prophesy? That means women are prophesying. What are we going to do? Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Now, we're going to, you know, some way or another in this end generation where we got these preachers that preach women should never say a word in church, they shouldn't prophesy or preach. We're going to have to get rid of the preachers. But teach that. Because it's very obvious here that God intends to use those women that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And you know, in Acts, uh, where is it? Acts um, 22, I think it is, where uh, this old boy had four daughters, all of them virgins, and they were all prophets. So this isn't a new thing. I said, this man had four virgin daughters. That means they weren't exposed to man. Maybe not even a revolving rev. Wouldn't that be something? And they prophesy. It's almost unheard of. And then, you know, people, but a woman is not supposed to speak in church. No, no, come on, come on. It's a figure of speech, a metaphor that is an old, like, kind of like an old wives' fable, if you will, unfair, but that's the way we communicate, meaning people shouldn't chatter in church while God's messenger is preaching. I won't put up with it. I don't care if it's the hairy-leggedest old boys in the community. If they start chattering or opening their mouth in my service, I'm going to throw them out. I'll do the same thing with women. I'll ask them to leave if they're going to chatter while God's word is being taught. So it's time for a little maturing in more ways than one, is it not? Isn't it strange? But I tell you this, the circumcision of the end times is of the heart, not the flesh. And why? Because it's for both men and women to have eyes to see and ears to hear and to accomplish, I say accomplish, the warning that is foretold of in this prophecy. Yep, it's in the Old Testament, isn't it? Well, our preacher told us that the Old Testament was all history and done away with. 
Oh, you're in you're in a heap of hurt for a teacher then, aren't you? Because this is quoted in the New Testament as well, and we're going to go there in a little bit. It's real sad that God didn't send more actual teachers, but that's the way it is. Gifts from God are without re, without recall. If you have one, use it. Teach. Give the warning. Plant seeds. Men, women, and children. Did, how many did it say to leave out of this gathering? It said even the suckling babes, that means all, A-L-L, -L, all will participate that have eyes to see and ears to hear. Verse 29, continuing. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days when... What days? The days just prior to the Lord's day. In those days will I pour out my spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit, of course. Have you ever heard of Pentecost Day? When Jesus would say, don't leave Jerusalem, stay there. On the 40th day, he told them this. What happened on the 50th day? 50 in the Greek tongue being Pentecost. The spirit was poured out. That's why they were speaking as they were speaking. And I don't know, does the Holy Spirit fall on women too? Hmm. Well, I'm sure it does. I know he does. He doesn't really uh, practice uh, uh, gender worship. He loves all his children. Verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens. What's this? I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. I don't know, have you seen any wonders in the heaven recently? Hmm, well, not that, uh, not that you can really speak of. Well, I saw one not too long ago, along about dark 30 in the evening. I observed the station Mir, the Russian uh, uh, station Mir, and I observed the satellite, that our satellite that had just parted from it. Uh, it it's difficult to judge mileage that far away, but it was uh, up, you know, probably 4,000 miles following as it was getting ready to come back into Earth's orbit. It just had a load of people there. You mean men are in space? You know, when I was a boy, that would have, that would have been uh, unbelievable. Not to mention the fact that we have photos of Mars and little tinker toys running around on it. Not to mention the fantastic um, signs in the heavens of, uh, of uh, our planet being visited by two comets in, in a year's time, much less, uh, not to mention many unusual things such as the moon that announces Passover and Feast of Tabernacles according to the Hebrew calendar Totally eclipsed, both times, exactly six months apart. <gasps> Boy, what, how could that happen? Well, for some people, I suppose it would be an oddity. There are many things happening that could be considered as signs. Now, I've got to pick back up where I, where I, if I can find my place. Signs in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Oh my, where have we seen pillars of smoke? Well, I'll show you one in a few minutes. And it just so, but I, I'm, I'm caught up on this Pentecost day thing and I want to turn to the book of Acts with you. And let me tell you a little bit about what happened on that day in uh, Pentecost in Acts. Um, just before that uh, they all began to speak. Jesus had, uh, had given the words that, that I forementioned. And um, 
Um, if I can find Acts, I can't seem to find it in this old Bible. Here it is. While, while I'm on that particular page, and, um, okay, we're, we're going to go to the second chapter, okay? Acts chapter 2. I want to tell you a little bit about Pentecost Day. Jesus had told them, as I forestated, 40, year, 40 days that uh, on the 40th day after, after um, uh, he was with them there, don't leave Jerusalem till you receive the Spirit. The, that's what you're to wait for. Well, it came on the 50th day, and they spoke in, in the Greek tongue that that is called cloven tongues. Cloven tongues. And what does that mean? It means it, it certainly doesn't mean it was unknown, unknown tongue. All right, you won't find that as any part of it. But it means that it was a tongue that came out in many directions, meaning this, every language of the world. Because on this day of, um, of celebration, which Pentecost is, then people gathered into Jerusalem from all parts of the country, meaning you had all the languages there. But this Holy Spirit fell on these people, and what did they begin to say? Let's pick it up in the sixth verse and see what they said. Sixth verse. Now, when this was noised, spoken abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were stunned because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Do you, do you see anything unknown about that Pentecostal tongue? No. What stunned them was that every man heard the voice in his own language. It needed no translator. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now, Galilee was kind of a country place, and they should have all spoke with a brawl kind of like you all, like kind of like down south way, I jest, but so that you know, I mean, it was a recognized brogue easily recognized that these city slickers didn't talk like that, you know. They said, and I hear him speaking in my tongue in my own dialect, my own language. You see, what they were hearing was not the voice of the person, but the Holy Spirit speaking to each individual regardless of what his language was. Verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? I mean, we're hearing them in the dialect of the local county in which I was born. In other words, that's the Pentecostal tongue. Nothing unknown about it. But you see, beloved, that is the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? If someone can accomplish that, then they are speaking in that language of Pentecost Day. Every entity, without fail, hears it. I don't know what county you were born in, but that's what it will sound like to you, meaning you better hear it. There will be no excuse for not having understood. And I dare anyone to find the word unknown connected with that prophecy. It isn't. It's just the opposite. Well, I, I wonder. I mean, everybody really makes a lot over that Pentecost term. But if they all understood it, why don't they wonder what was said? You know, if they all understood, are we just going to, or is God going to just hang us up here, or, or what's he, what, what is he saying? What did they say? Well, with that, we're going to skip down to the 14th verse and find out, okay? I think it's important that we should find out. The 14th verse reads, And Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, 
Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. I mean, some had accused them of being drunk. They thought, are they, what, what is wrong with them? How are they doing this? Verse 15, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. In other words, nobody took a drink before 9 a.m. Didn't do that. 16. But this is, whoa, now here you got it. Hang on. Great mystery of God's word about to unfold. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What was it again that Joel meant? Yahweh is God. Then do you know what they were saying then, apparently? They were repeating Joel's message, weren't they? Hey, you're very intelligent. Naturally, that's what they were saying. Nothing unknown about it. Now let's continue, verse 17. And it shall come to pass, in the last days said God, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, not some of it, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Well, there's those daughters again, and this is the New Testament. Praise God, what are we going to do with those reverends? And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18. And on my servants, and on my handmaidens, there they are again. God bless them. God's going to use them, as he already does. I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Not maybe, not perhaps, shall. This is why it's written in Mark 13 that when you're delivered up before the false Messiah, you're not to premeditate what you will say or speak, think or speak, but you will speak that that is given you in that hour, what hour? The hour of temptation by the Holy Spirit. For it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you. It's a one-time thing before the spurious Messiah when you're delivered up. And that's why it is written in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, that anyone that refuses the Holy Spirit that have eyes to see and ears to hear, the privilege of speaking through them that it is unpardonable. It is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It is unforgivable. It is the unforgivable sin. Will it happen? No way. Everyone would be anxious. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Well, that's just like it was in Joel. That's what Peter told you. 20. The sun shall be dark, turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. What day is that? The Lord's day. All right. Told you the fire, the sun, the, naturally the sun when Christ returns, for he outshines it. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call. That's whosoever. That means all everyone, every tongue, every creed that shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I don't know. How are you doing? How, how awake are you? Well, what is this pillars of fire and smoke coming up from the earth? Well, I don't know. Uh, do you know what happened in the year of our Lord, 1980, on Pentecost uh, uh, season, day? Have you ever heard, what does St. Helen mean? It means light bearer. A lot of light was shined on the Mount St. Helen uh, eruption. Let's, let's see, the Seattle Intelligencer, one of their main newspapers in that area, happened, there was a photographer flying in the area at the time of the eruption, and he snapped a very interesting picture. I want to share that picture with you at this time, if we may. May we see the picture of uh, the Mount St. Helens eruption. Now, I want you to look very closely. Here you see the aileron in this top corner. 
of the airplane in which this was snapped from. This was not taken by a member of the Shepherd's Chapel crew. I want you to note the teeth, the nose, the eyes, the forehead, and the hair of this, uh, the chin, on the, this face, and it was titled Cheekbones, Eyes Closed, as if prayerfully looking over this nation. Pillars of fire smoke coming from the earth. There was also lightning in this picture at the time it was taken. Sorry, it doesn't show up, but it was there in many uh, stations that were in the area. Again, one more time, the chin, the lip, the teeth, the uh, upper lip, the nose, and the eyes, forehead, hair above the forehead, and you have a side profile here chin and neck. Is it, uh, well, it's just a bunch of smoke. Well, yeah, it is. But it's very, very biblical that smoke and fire would come up from the earth. And this happened on Pentecost, uh, in the season of Pentecost. And uh, some people would call it an accident or just a, a happenstance. I don't. I think that our Heavenly Father brought this to pass whereby you would know there are things happening if you're not asleep. And the important thing is there are things that were written in God's Word bringing uh, to surface the, and to catch the attention of those that have eyes to see. I want to complete that second chapter. We only like one verse, verse 32, of that second chapter of Joel. Back to it, and we'll complete the lecture this time. In verse 32 of chapter 2, the great book of Joel, and it reads, And it shall come to pass, not maybe, it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I don't know, are you, do you know what a remnant is? The remnant is God's elect, those that do plant the seeds, those that do have eyes to see and ears to hear, those that do and can tell time. I'm talking about spiritual time. Can you? Have you always known since you were a child there was more to God's word than you had been taught? Have you listened to too many one verse, Charlie, revolving revs? You need God's word taught to you chapter by chapter and verse by verse so that you hear God's word, not man's. Don't miss the next lecture. We go into the nations and their formation at the time of the end. I wonder if you'll be able to recognize any of them. You see, God's word is real. God doesn't play guessing games. Sound the alarm before that great notable day of the Lord so that you're not ashamed. Don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to be a gallant one that will stand and use the authority that God has given you to fight the negative, the satanic powers that we see in this earth at this time. Morals no more longer seem to be of any interest. I assure you there, it's in the book. Everything that you have done, else you repent and then it's a clean slate. But I, what I'm, why I'm saying that, look around you, open your eyes, observe what's happening and compare it to God's word. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment.